Hey everyone, this is Zephyr, and welcome to the BaileyWiki channel, where we teach everyday DMs how to create truly amazing experiences for their players by combining art and technology. We also make modular systems and scenes that you can use without any setup for your games. If you're a DM who likes to wow your players and you're using platforms like Foundry Virtual Tabletop and Dungeon Draft, then you're in the right place. Today, we're back with another installment of automating Foundry using Monk's Active Tile Triggers. Today, we're gonna to be going through how to recreate something like this combination lock puzzle room inspired by Baldur's Gate 3. If you're using the BaileyWiki Premium Modules, you can actually bring this in as an entire prefab. If you're watching this in October of 2023, you can find it in the BW Prefabs 00 New Content Compendium. And it's under the MATT combination puzzle room. If you're watching this after October 2023, you can find it in the modular building set under modular rooms. You can just search for MATT if you want to get there faster. To create this, we're going to be leveraging Monk's active tile triggers as always, and also a bit of tagger. As you can see, this looks pretty polished here, and I've got some reminders in place for myself and for users for determining what order to press the buttons in. We even have a handy reset switch so that once the puzzle has been completed, and the door is open, this no longer functions, so you can't accidentally lock yourself out after you have done the puzzle successfully. We can use the reset switch to get rid of that. So we cover all of this in this tutorial. So if you're interested in learning how to leverage the new variables function of Monk's Active Tile Triggers, stick around and check out the timestamps for breakdowns along the way. To break this down a little more simply, let's take a look at a really deconstructed and simplified version of this puzzle. You can see that we basically have five different switches that we're activating in order to actually solve this puzzle. We have a fail or just a completely incorrect number or tile in the sequence. And then we have our four success pieces. This particular setup only has four numbers and you have to put those exact four numbers in order. You can't repeat any of them, which is probably good in terms of our players being able to solve these if they miss on any clues for what the actual combination is. And you can see just like with the example puzzle that we showed, if I click on this success one, it's going to give me a green light indicating that. And if I click on it again, so combination one, one, it's going to fail as opposed to the correct combination of one, two, three, four. And when I build up on this, if I go back to that fail state, it will again clear all of our progress. But if we go through all of these in succession, the door will open and we will have all of our lights on and we have successfully solved the puzzle. The tiles will still click here, but nothing will happen there. And we'll have to use this reset switch that we have set up in order to reset the puzzle and allow us to activate things again. So now that we have taken a look at kind of the basic flow here, let's go ahead and dive into the tiles. Again, there's these five separate tiles and they all look very similar. If we go to our triggers here, then these are going to trigger just on enter here. You could change these to be click tiles with a hover over pointer, or you could make them on exit or movement. There's a variety of different ways you could handle this, but the basics here are we're gonna use an enter action. And then our actions are super simple. We're just using a scrolling text action that is going to have that click. You could also add a play sound if you want to. I find that using a lot of play sounds can get a little tiresome on the ears if you're doing a bunch of these, but that's completely up to you. And then finally, we're going to trigger the tile, which is going to be the puzzle door over here. And you'll notice that when we trigger this, we have a specific landing in mind, and that's going to be failure. This use returned data is completely unnecessary. We're not actually bringing any data back, so it's fine to leave that checked or unchecked, whatever you prefer. This allow disabled is important to leave unchecked because otherwise it would still fire off this tile if we were uh, to disable it. And that's how we're gonna actually turn off the puzzle once we've correctly solved it. Then you can see with all of these successes, it's set up the exact same way as the failures. The difference is what landing it goes to. So we have success one, two, three, and four in place here. And again, that's true on all of these. 
So if you want to take a screenshot or just pause the screen here to take a look at the setup for the tiles, here you go. It's quite simple on these individual tiles that are triggering it. Then if we take a look at our actual tile, you can see it's tagged with the puzzle door A. And then if we look at the triggers, we have all of these different landings. There's that great feature from Monk's Active Tile Triggers that when you use landings, and particularly if you have this stop when reached in code on a landing, it's going to give you a color code area and it's going to stop when you get to the next landing. We're not going to cover this in depth here, but if you want to learn more about landings, check out our previous Automating Foundry video linked on screen now where we dive into landings a little bit more. Now we're going to get into the meat and potatoes of the real feature that powers this, and that's going to be variables. So here we're using a filter by attributes option here, and this allows us to look for the monk's active tile flag from the module for the variables. And whenever you're looking for flags from different modules, you're just going to do this flags dot and then the module ID. So when you open up a module manifest, it'll be all one word. And if there are separations, it'll have hyphens, etc. And then dot then whatever the name of the flag is and drilling down into that. So this is flags. So any flags at all from the monks active tiles module, and then the variables flag from that module. And finally, the name of the variable that we are defining here. So, and what's great is if you are adding a variable to a tile, it initializes at zero. So here we are, we're checking to see if the success is at zero. And then we're going to proceed through this workflow here. If we do not find that, then our next piece is going to be a check entity count. And it's just going to be checking our current tiles that we're looking through. And you can find that by using this current collection button and then selecting tiles from the dropdown. And we're just trying to figure out if there is more than zero. So for example, if this was at a different success number than zero, then this would fail and we'd go to failure. The only way we're getting to this landing is if we're triggering it from the success one tile. Then the next step is to increment our active tiles variable or rather set it. So we're gonna set it to one, indicating that one of the correct numbers in the sequence has been added and we're naming the variable success. You could also name this correct or any other thing that you want, like combination, et cetera. And then we're going to activate the success light A. And that's just going to be this light over here. You can use a variety of different things to indicate a positive result. You could show a tile or hide a tile. You could play different sounds, et cetera. All of these are perfectly valid options. I like the light option because it is a persistent reminder that you have one success. And then because we have that stop when reached in code on these landings again, then this is just going to end remaining actions and we're done. And then you can see that these are all structured very similarly. We are basically just going to be having a landing that's named based upon which number in the combination we're using. So you could even change those landings to whatever you want, etc. We're going to filter by attributes and check for that variable that we set up. And it's important to note that this success variable, that's just what we've decided to name it here. You could name it anything you want, just whatever you put in here for this attribute that you're filtering for is also going to use for the set active tiles variable. These need to be the exact same. So for all of these, we find the correct variable. So for example, on success two, we want to make sure that success is equal to one before we fire the code there. And for success three, we're going to check for success to be equal to two, et cetera. And then when we finish modifying these things, we're going to be updating our success counter uh, by one number. So success two requires the success of one to fire. And when it's done, it will change the success variable to two. And this allows us to store a lot of complexity here. You could combine this with additional tiles and have basically two sets of variables that you're working with to make even more complex puzzles, et cetera. And then we're activating whatever our incremental success indicators are. In this case, those lights. So you can take a screenshot and look at what each of these individual pieces are. I'm going to have this trigger action here while we discuss this a little bit more. So this is a great place to pause the video if you want to double check what the 
flags or attributes you're looking for and kind of see the structure of this. Finally, when we get to this last success, that's where you're actually going to finish up the puzzle. So as per usual, we're going to be finding the tile that has the correct amount of success flags on it for your final piece. And then if we fail, we're gonna to go to our failure landing. And then we don't technically need to set the active tiles variable, but it is good practice to set it to four. This is mainly helpful if we're going to go back and edit this later. Maybe we're going to build upon this or there's going to be something else down the line that checks to see if this tile is at a success state of four. It's an easy way to be able to go back and check, did they solve this puzzle? Um, so it's a really good way to handle that. Then we're gonna activate our final incremental success indicator. And then we have a final one in the form of this audio. We're going to play the sound of the door opening. And finally, we're going to do whatever the puzzle is supposed to unlock. In this case, we're changing a door. And if you have not been following along with Monk's Active Tile Triggers development lately, there is this great new addition to the change wall slash door action. Now we can actually set up a variety of configuration pieces here rather than using the alter actions. We're able to switch between regular walls, that's gonna be the none, door, and secret door, or you can toggle back and forth between door and regular or and wall rather. Then you have your door states for whether it's closed, open, or locked, and then you have your movement, light, sight, and sound restrictions. And if you're using the new proximity or reverse proximity pieces, you can do that as well. So we're using the change wall door rather than a bunch of alter commands to change this door. I like to have it as a secret door so that it's a quick reminder for me as a GM that there's a puzzle here that's going to open up this door and that is going to give me just a reminder. My players are never gonna see that it's a door so you could leave this as just a regular normal wall but I prefer to have it be a secret door when it's closed. So we change our door and then finally we deactivate this tile which then means all of these tiles that we have here because when we trigger them and they trigger our master control tile or our puzzle door tile, then it's not going to fire because we don't have this allow when disabled clicked on. So that basically turns off the puzzle, which means once you've solved it, you're good. You no longer have to step around on your tiptoes to make sure you don't accidentally close the door and have to repeat the puzzle. So now is a great time if you want to take a look at what the final success looks like. You can pause the video here, take a screenshot, have this on your other screen whenever you're trying to replicate this, et cetera, and you can just see how this varies. It's very similar to our initial piece. We're just having our final activation condition realized here. And then we can see we have the failure and this little reset loop down here. So a failure landing is just going to deactivate puzzle lights and set the tile success variable to zero. And you'll notice that if I open up these lights, these are tagged as success light A, B, C, and D, and they all have the puzzle light tag. And this is why we need tagger here, because without tagger, we could individually turn on and off lights, but we couldn't turn on and off all four of them with one activation. You would have to do separate activations for each individual light, and that just gets a little more tedious. You could still do it without tagger, but it's significantly easier to use tagger and just have that one universal tag for the whole group of lights and then have individual tags when you're trying to activate them one by one. So then that's our failure reset. And then our hard reset is powered by this button over here. And that is going to basically return the door to the starting state. So this is what you use when you have completely solved the puzzle. In particular, if you are doing testing with this, and you want to reset it so that then your players can actually go use it, you want to have this reset loop down here. So the reset loop consists of just a landing that we're gonna to go to, and we're resetting the variable to whatever our initialization value is, so in this case, zero. And in most cases, you're gonna to wanna to leave it as zero because that's what the variables will normally initialize at. Otherwise, you'd have kind of a discrepancy between whether you hit reset or you just activate it for the first time. Yeah, then you're going to undo basically whatever your success condition is. So in our final success, we change the secret wall into a just empty wall. And then we'll change it back into a secret door and close everything over here. And then we'll also deactivate all of our puzzle lights that come on when we are successful. You'll notice that we don't change this tile from 
the deactivated state to the active state in this particular reset landing. And that's because we're actually handling it over here on our reset switch. So if we go to triggers, it has activate puzzle door A. So it's going to be activating our puzzle door and then it's going to trigger it. The reason for that is because then we absolutely make sure this is active before we trigger it. And then it should run through all of these successfully. In previous versions of Monk's Active Tile Triggers, if you made the activation of this tile a part of this reset landing, it would actually only execute the first action under that landing and it would stop. In theory, you could put the activate over here, but out of a force of habit and also to make sure this is as robust as possible, we're doing the activation on this reset switch before we do the triggering. That's going to conclude this episode of Automating Foundry. I hope that this has given you some insight on how you can leverage the variable system within Monk's Active Tile Triggers and given you some inspiration on different puzzles or traps that you can use in your own games. Obviously, we were heavily inspired by Baldur's Gate 3 when we created this, but you can use this for a variety of different puzzles or effects within your games. By no means do you have to just use a keypad. You could also hook this up to a variety of levers found throughout a dungeon that perhaps Activating all of them gives you one effect, but activating them in a specific order gives an additional bonus. There's a lot of different possibilities here, and I hope that this has gotten your wheels turning a bit in terms of your puzzle and room design. As always, let me know in the comments if you have any questions or you'd like to see a follow-up on any of this, and what you'd like to see us cover next. This has been Zephyr with the Baby Wiki channel. Thank you so much for watching, and if you enjoyed this content, subscribe to keep up with all of our latest videos, and consider becoming a patron. Not only do you support the channel, but you'll also gain access to all of the modular systems and scenes that we've ever made, including the prefab of this puzzle room for you to deploy into any map. Once again, thanks so much for watching, happy gaming, and have a good one.